good afternoon to all so welcome back to the session 5 of uh, day 2 so this session is basically on the topic edge computing or uh, the fog computing so this session will be uh, taken by dr satish narayan sri rama so i'd like to just uh, provide you a brief details about the dr satish sri rama gar Satish Narayan Sri Rama is an uh, associate professor at the School of Computer and Information Sciences, University of Hyderabad. He is also a visiting professor and the honorary head of the Mobile and Cloud Lab at the Institute of Computer Science, University of Tartu, Estonia, which he led as a research professor until June 2020. He received his PhD in computer science from RWTH Aachen University, Germany in 2008. his current research focuses on cloud computing mobile web services mobile cloud internet of things fog computing migrating scientific computing and enterprise applications to the cloud and large scale data analytics on the cloud he is a senior member of the institute of electrical and electronic engineers that is ieee and editor of willis software practice and experience which is a 50 years old journal and he was an associate editor of ieee transactions in cloud computing and he is also a program committee member of several international conferences and workshops dr sri rama has co-authored over 150 refereed scientific publications in international conferences and journals so thank you sir thank you for accepting our invitation so may i now request you to uh, take over the session sir Dr. Nagendra, thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, so let me first share the screen and also the presentation. Okay. <coughs> you can see the entire presentation, is it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. So, how's it going to be this? right good afternoon everyone okay welcome to this talk thank you nagendra for basically presenting about myself okay uh, in this talk like i'll be talking about edge or fog computing okay rather i will start with the concepts and i'll go and discuss about state of the art and also like future research directions you can actually reach me at satish.sriyama@university-of-hyderabad.ac.in if you have any questions in the middle you can actually stop me in the bit okay don't worry you can raise your hand so as i said like as part of this talk i will be talking about cloud centric internet of things okay in the beginning and then like uh, we will be talking about fog computing and fog computing challenges uh, fog placement strategies and future research right so this will be the agenda okay for this talk so we already have discussed what are internet of things basically these things are actually communicating among themselves okay yesterday we had some discussion what are things okay philosophically there used to be a lot of discussion 3 or 4 years ago okay and the people were uh, thinking like what we should be calling a thing okay if there is a temperature sensor lying in a car now should we be calling it as a thing okay and people at the end like after some discussion have come to a conclusion like things should be physical objects with sensing capabilities okay something like sensors or whatever it is Okay, say for example, you can think of very simple application. Assume like there is an object lying in this room in a corner. It has uh, different sensors. Say for example, like it can measure the CO2 level in this room, and uh, say for example, it can also measure the temperature in this room, humidity in this room, and it has enough intelligence so that like when it finds uh, certain values are at a certain stage, it will open the doors or windows when it is ideal to open one of the doors or windows. If it can actually decide. and it is an iot based application so actually these things are communicating among themselves so that is the basic idea <clears throat> so most of these uh, internet of things based applications today are based on cloud centric internet of things based hierarchy okay thank you very much to professor rajiv walker who has given us excellent background about cloud and this actually sets very nice platform for this talk as well okay thank you for that so basically in terms of cloud centric internet of things hierarchy so at the core level at the base level you have these sensors okay from which like we are collecting this sensor information say for example in the example which i have given we are collecting the co2 level okay humidity temperature at this level and we are putting them at the gateway layers okay connectivity nodes okay 
So more or less, we will be putting like uh, on the gateway node something like a Raspberry Pi or whatever it is. Okay. And from there, like we are actually pushing the data to the cloud where it is actually stored. It can be both push mechanism and pull mechanism. Okay. So which was already discussed in the last session. Okay. Based on that one, it will be actually stored there and then like it will be processed. If at all a control signal has to be sent back, okay, say for example, like in the earlier example, which I have discussed, okay, say for example, the control signal of opening one of the doors has to come back, then it has to come back in the same route and it has to basically actuate a particular a door knob or whatever it is. Okay, so this is the basic cloud centric Internet of Things based hierarchy. So if we look at each layer, at this the base layer is the sensing and smart devices, which we have discussed extensively yesterday, thanks to Dr. Nagender. So he has given us excellent background yesterday. So now we know what are sensors or what are actuators, okay, how they basically work and what are the basic communication protocols using which we can actually talk with those sensors. Okay. Say for example, Zigbee, Z Wave, Wi-Fi Direct, or Bluetooth. Okay. And there are also perfect microcontrollers using which you can actually do some sort of rapid prototype. Okay, so this is also like yesterday we have discussed in detail. So now I hope like you are all clear with these things. Okay, so more, more or less what are sensors, what are smart devices, and what are these sort of microcontrollers. Now comes the next layer. Okay, say for example, here are the sensors. So these sensors are to basically communicate with these gateway layers. <clears throat> the gateway layers primarily deal with this sort of sensor data acquisition and provisioning. Okay. So basically like the sensor data is actually collected here, which is to be provided. Uh, it is either to be provisioned up or like you are trying to act. Okay, you are basically trying to access that information. Okay. One very interesting thing, okay, one thing like which we have not considered until now in this FTP is a mobile can also participate as a gateway. Okay, the, which is very interesting, which Professor Raji Monker has just started and he wanted me to take that lead as well. Okay, so basically like I will also discuss a little bit about that. Okay. Mobile is a very interesting thing. So basically, I probably assume like all of you know, there are almost about 40 different sensors in this mobile. Okay. It has accelerometer sensor, gyroscope sensor, several basic sensors are there. Okay. Using which you can actually predict whether I am sitting here, whether I'm walking, whether I'm running, whether I'm jogging. Okay. It also knows about my location, exact location, GPS location. It can tell whether I'm at the office, whether I'm at home. It knows a lot of personal information about me, my personal preferences. Okay, what is uh, what are the web pages which I generally view? What are the applications which I am regularly opening? Okay, and say for example, like what are the fitness applications, whatever I am trying. Okay, so all this information can be used in developing different sorts of applications. Okay, so the mobile would be a very interesting gateway from which, like, you can collect a lot of sensor information, which can be actually used in this sort of uh, different IoT-based applications. And yesterday there was some discussion whether uh, like Raspberry Pis can be servers or not. Okay, Raspberry Pis can be servers. Okay, even mobile phone can act as a server. Way back in 2003, I was at Ericsson Research. Okay, at the time, we have prepared the first mobile web service provider on a Sony Ericsson smartphone. Way back in 2003, it used to be have around 12 megabytes of memory. Okay, including for the application storage and for processing. Even with such low capabilities, like you can actually do the processing. On Raspberry Pi, perfectly you can have a web service provider. Okay, so this actually brings mobiles, also mobile web services and mobile cloud services into this sort of Internet of Things space. Uh, Great. So now we have talked what are these sort of sensors, what are these gateways, how the basic interaction is happening. Now, how about like basically putting the things up, okay, from these sort of gateway nodes to the cloud. So from the Raspberry Pi yesterday we have discussed, okay, say for example, using MQTT, the server can, the cloud servers can basically directly invoke the uh, data and then like it can be stored there on the cloud, okay. Alternatively, you can directly push it there. But if you think in terms of if it is a mobile phone, you have to think a little bit differently as well. Okay, say for example, mobile always had some sort of resource limitations. The amount of processing you can do is always limited. So the, basically this has led to this new domain called mobile cloud domain, okay. So harnessing this sort of cloud computing resources from these mobile devices. Okay, how you actually invoke the cloud services from the mobiles. Mobile gets a lot of advantages because now it will have increased storage capacity. Okay, unlimited processing power, access to that. Okay, so that's actually good for different mobile applications as well. Okay, along with the Internet of Things based applications. But if you want to invoke the services of the cloud from the mobile, 
there are different binding models which were studied over the years. Okay, so almost like a, a decade and half, like we have actually focused at addressing these problems. So there are different binding models. One of them is fast delegation model, which actually follows the traditional service oriented architecture model. And then like you will have middlewares using which like you can actually invoke the services of multiple cloud providers. Okay, this is more, this model is called fast delegation. Okay, if you are curious, like I always have mentioned these sort of applications where you can actually get some information. I am also mentioning all the things at the end as references. Okay, so I will also make the slides open and public. Okay, so you can basically have a look at them if anybody is curious. So there is also a second approach called mobile code offloading. Okay, so the task delegation is a service oriented architecture model using which like you are trying to invoke multiple services from clouds. Whereas the code offloading is, while you are executing a mobile application, okay, under a particular context, a method, okay, one of the method in the execution cycle. Say, for example, it is it has to do some sort of large scale data analytics, okay, or some sensor data analytics, or like a face recognition sort of heavy processing or something. What it can do is under a particular context, the context is actually critical here. Say, for example, if you are in wireless networks, okay. And then say, for example, my battery level is 40 percent so I can still transfer the data. It is better to basically do the processing somewhere else on this sort of cloud surrogates we used to call, okay? So the surrogate machines, so basically like what it will happen is the program will execute until that method, and that method will be basically offloaded to this sort of cloud surrogate, and you do the execution there, you come back to the mobile application, you will continue with the execution of it. This is called mobile code offloading. Theoretically, these concepts are complete, not completely new. Okay, say for example, in distributed processing, people who know about RMI, report procedural calls, these are fundamental concepts. Okay, so the technology will be revisited to address a particular challenge again and again. Okay, this is very interesting thing to remember. That's about the mobile cloud. Then comes this sort of uh, higher layer, which is the cloud computing, the topmost layer. So Professor Rajiv Mankar has given excellent uh, background about this cloud computing, okay? So we have seen like how this sort of processing can be done. But why it is so critical for IoT? Already like in 2020, we have generated jettabytes of data, which is 10 to the power of 21 bytes, okay? So all this data has to be properly stored, analyzed, interpreted, and presented. These are very huge challenges. So that's how like big data acquisition and analytics basically jumps into IoT. So there are several solutions, something like MapReduce and Spark, using which like you can actually sterilize these tasks. You can run on hundreds of cloud instances possible, and you can actually do this sort of large scale data analytics. Okay. That's possible with these sort of MapReduce frameworks and then like these distributed frameworks. It is actually possible. Okay, it is feasible. Now, the interesting thing is Internet of Things not only deals with this sort of big data, but it also deals with big streaming data. One interesting thing of IoT is it is not like we have generated all these jettabytes of data at once and then like stored there, which is like the usual map that is processing. So for example, you will have petabytes of data stored, you will distribute them, and then like you will do the processing, replicate. Basically, you will take care of fault tolerance and everything. But with this map reduced data, with this sort of IoT data, it is big streaming data. Say, for example, if you are doing some sort of video processing. The video is continuously coming. That means like the streams are continuously coming and you should be able to process these streams continuously. How do you deal with this? So there are different solutions for that one. Say, for example, you can put this data into some sort of message queue, something like Apache Kafka. You can buffer them. You can feed the data to some sort of stream data processing solution, something like Apache Storm. Or else like uh, Apache uh, Spark streaming solution is there. Okay, so you can use one of these uh, solutions. Of course, Flink also has another solution, okay? So there are a lot of different solutions for that. But the idea is basically you are generating the data at these sort of sensors, which is actually being collected at these sort of clouds, and there it is actually processed and any control signals have to be sent, they will be sent back like this. Most of the IoT applications which you see today are based on this model, cloud-centric Internet of Things based model. There are also several standard platforms available, okay? So middleware and the infrastructure that actually enable end users to actually interact with these smart objects, okay? Say for example, the violin thing, okay? So that, that is also like based on a cloud-based application. So again, that has already mentioned like it is based on Docker containers, okay? So that is how like we are actually trying to interact, uh, are basically trying to access uh, 
these sort of Raspberry Pis which are lying in University of Hyderabad. Most of these IoT platforms, okay, there are huge number of platforms available. They basically provide you some sort of data stories. So how you can actually push the data there. Data processing is possible. You can do some sort of analytics. They also provide some sort of visualization mechanisms, how to discover these sort of uh, devices and then like you can manage the devices, okay? And most of these platforms are uh, based on this cloud centric Internet of Things hierarchy, okay? But of course, like there are also other models like centralized, decentralized, which I will try to discuss in the remaining uh, uh, presentation. Some of the well-known platforms are like Node-RED, okay? FP7, Open IoT, ThingSpeak, which is probably used extensively in India in different lectures and so and so, okay? AWS also has this IoT and ThingsWorks and Fubulous platforms, okay? So a lot of different platforms are there, okay? Using which like you can actually develop cloud-centric Internet of Things-based applications. Great. But there are several problems with this sort of cloud-centric Internet of Things, okay? Some of the very well-known problems are, say for example, think about a pure cloud-only solution. Think about a application where like you are deploying thousands of sensors across different parts. Okay, say for example, across this university. Now you have to send all this data. So every sensor data which has been generated by every sensor there, you have to actually push to the cloud. The cost would be pretty huge. Since there will be a lot of uh, parallel data will be going, you cannot have a single instance which is collecting everything. It will not properly, properly, properly scale up. Okay. So the cost is pretty high for this sort of cloud-centric uh, IoT-based applications. Of course, there will be also be a challenge with this sort of uh, latency issues, okay? Uh, say, for example, think about the IoT applications, okay? Uh, something related to healthcare application, which is, say, for example, related to uh, today's situation, the COVID, okay? Now, assume like uh, you have different sensors, which is like oxygen pulse, okay? Sensor, sensor okay? Using which like you are actually measuring oxygen saturation in the blood, okay? And then like you are also measuring, say for example, blood pressure and probably heartbeat. And say for example, you also have this sort of ECG attached to it. You are collecting all the information and assume like you have a perfect algorithm, perfect algorithm, which actually can predict the person having a heart attack five minutes before. Okay, think about this scenario. Will you be doing this processing in the cloud? where like you will send all the data to the cloud and you will be doing the processing there. And then like before the answer comes, like there will be several minutes. If not, at least few more seconds, you will not be doing that, okay? You would like to do the processing somewhere closure, okay? So that's where like we are actually trying to. And of course, like uh, there are also issues, like say for example, with smart cities and past, the surveillance actually needs real-time responses. Many IoT services basically require less than 10 milliseconds response and to end latencies, okay? So that's a huge challenge with this sort of cloud-centered IoT-based applications. Of course, network load is also a very big challenge. So if you are sending all the sensor information to the cloud, okay, how much load you are actually putting on the internet? And of course, also the private networks, okay? This would be like some of the challenges. And then like there are also other challenges. Say for example, certain scenarios do not even let you move the data to the cloud. Okay, so I will tell you from my earlier experience, okay, when I was at Estonia, okay, at the University of Tartu, European Union, okay, is a, okay, so it is a trade union, more or less like basically like uh, uh, it's an economic zone where like everything can be shared across different countries, but not the health data. Personal health records cannot never be able to leave the borders. So Estonian data should be processed in Estonia itself. So it cannot be sent to a cloud which is lying in, uh, in Germany or in, say for example, or in UK or even to US, okay? It is not possible. So there will be certain scenarios where you cannot move the data. Then what would be the solution in such a case? The best idea is to process the data as close to where it is actually generated. So the idea is, that is where like this sort of edge or fog computing basically comes into picture, okay? push the processing as low as possible in terms of this cloud-centric internet of things layers, okay? So if you can process them at the sensors, process them there. Because we are calling them things, okay? So not just sensors, okay? So basically like things also have sort of some computational capabilities. So process them there, if not at the gateways, if not at these sort of intermediate network switches and routers, which eventually lead you to the cloud computing. So that means like this process is basically happening across all these layers. 
you might have heard about different terminals here. Okay, and people might have really got confused. I have been seeing these developments for the past 15 years. Okay, so it's a good time that I will give you a quick summary about these sort of developments. Okay, and then like make certain things clear for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So you might have heard about edge computing. You might have heard about fob computing. What are the differences basically? So originally, when we have started with these things, say for example, way back from 2003 itself, okay, 2003, 2006 itself, okay, where we were trying to push the processing to the sort of end devices, something like mobile phones or something, okay. Whenever the processing was done at the edge of the network, say for example, like by these sort of uh, things at the time, like nobody was calling them things, okay, but these sort of end embedded devices, okay, people called it as edge computing. Okay, some people call them as list computing. Okay, another terminology came. And then like these mobile computing guys, okay, say for example, like me as well, okay, at that time, whenever like a mobile task has to be done, we were doing the processing on the mobile and if we cannot do a processing something there, we used to offload the task to say, for example, a laptop lying within the close proximity. People call this also as edge computing. Okay, so the local server, whichever is lying around you, and if you are trying to do the processing there, people also called it as edge computing. Okay. Then some people actually call, like whenever like you are trying to offer from mobiles to say, for example, local servers, they call them as outlets. Okay, a lot of terminology we have seen over the years. And people also call, like, say, for example, if a processing is offloaded to a private cloud or like local bunch of servers, again, like they called it as edge computing. And another very interesting thing. Whenever, like, say, for example, instead of this laptop or like private cloud infrastructure, which I am using, if I was trying to offload the task from this mobiles to a base transit station, base, uh, which was deployed by these sort of mobile operator networks, if I was using the computational capacity which was offered by them, then people call them as mobile edge computing. Okay, a lot of discussions have happened, and then, like, eventually they came to standards, and now they are calling that sort of offloading to multi access edge computing. And of course, like then in 2012, like Cisco came <clears throat> and basically like Cisco actually started pushing this pop computing idea where like you can actually use the Cisco rotors and switches and they used to have this sort of IOX software, okay, operating system, okay, using which like you can actually do the processing and they basically started pushing this pop computing idea a lot. And again, like people started jumping in, everybody jumped in. Some people call them as pop computing, some people call them as edge computing, near edge, far edge. So you will see a lot of terminals. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is like te technology has changed a lot. It has used different names. The simplest concept is if you can do the processing at these edge devices, embedded devices are the things, the way like now Internet of Things is calling them, that is edge computing. And if you are trying to offload the task to something which is closer, okay, say for example, like the gateway devices are these intermediate networks, which is rotors and everything, you can call them as fog computing. People are interchanging edge and fog computing, okay, really, there is no problem with this one, okay. So hope that made things clear for several of you guys who were really confused with this sort of terminology and then like you were learning a lot of these things. <clears throat> so, that's great. Now the point is, okay, so we are trying to say like, okay, we need to push the processing as low as possible. What sort of applications are really critical? Where fog is actually being used? Okay, that question will always jump in. Fog is excellent for these sort of multimedia applications. Okay, say for example, like if you are doing some sort of video processing, you are sending these sort of video streams to the cloud. And yesterday, like one scenario has come into the discussion. Okay, say for example, like we want to detect the intruder. Okay. And we didn't want to eliminate the false alarms where like an animal has come into the picture, okay? The point is, assume like you have an excellent camera, it is taking like, say for example, 100 uh, frames per second. Do you really want to send all the 100 frames per second, okay, the video completely to the cloud and do the process? Alternatively, what you can do is like, say for example, like what is the best streaming rate under that particular context? And say for example, how much the network is loaded, based on that you can actually vary. And then say for example, like when the network is really loaded, you will say send, five frames per second, frames per second, or like say for example, 10 frames per second, and the network is not that much loaded. You can actually vary these things dynamically. Of course, this actually changes the quality of service a lot, okay? Of course, you can, there can be several other parameters which are also affected. Say for example, the cost is also matters. 
say for example, the amount of data you are sending to the cloud, whatever you are storing there will actually will cost you eventually. So that cost decision can also affect you. So basically, fog applications are perfect for these things. So in the gateway, say for example, whenever like you have got this sort of uh, video streaming, you can actually regulate. Okay, so this sort of encoding rate and like uh, at what rate like you are actually sending these uh, video streams up or yes. Okay, that's one application. It is also very good for sensor data filtering and pre-processing. Say for example, like I can uh, give you a perfect example which we were uh, trying in Estonia. Okay, say for example, like Estonia, we have a lot of forests there. There are a lot of forests. Okay? So basically, like uh, there will be regular fires, so they are to be monitored. So different sensors are to be deployed. Okay, so then what happens is like in summer, like you have to collect this data pretty often, but in winter you don't have to collect it so often because in winter there is a lot of snow around. The least temperature which I have seen is like minus thirty eight degrees. So basically you can assume like how much snow there will be. Okay, so this sort of pre processing you can actually do, and then say for example like at what rate like. You are actually collecting this information okay from that sensor sensor frequency calibration you can actually take care of that okay and the certain times like you can also do this sort of sensor data prediction today like we have different models okay so same time series analysis okay say for example using arima models okay you can actually predict like what would be the next sensor value if nothing has changed you can actually predict these values that requires certain processing okay that processing can be actually done somewhere in these fog nodes or in these gateway nodes okay so these are some generic applications where like this fog can be used. I have also seen like very specific applications where fog is being used. Okay, uh, I have seen them being used in this sort of interactive games. So this is like uh, electroencephalogram, mouthful word. <laughs> electroencephalogram uh, attractor beam game. So the basic idea is like you will have a, a band okay attached to your head. Okay which actually can measure the electric pulses which are actually being generated in your brain. So which actually you can use that real-time EEG signal analysis to this sort of brain state. And then like it can actually tell you like how concentrated you are at a particular thing, okay? So we at the University of Tartu, we also had a neuroscience uh, department, which actually was uh, checking this sort of uh, research, doing this research. So they had developed several games where like these people will be having these bands, okay, physically like you will be sitting there and then like you can uh, concentrate at the ball, you can actually try to pull the ball towards you, okay. People are playing these games, okay, interactive games. That's when you have the people in invisible jobs, okay. Now think about extended scenario a little bit further. Virtual games, okay, virtual reality is basically coming everywhere. So this is being used in different applications for different purposes, okay? So we have seen different applications where like virtually people are located at different places. They have these bands, okay, attached. And uh, all these friends were actually trying to play, say they are actually in the virtual environment, they are sitting around the circle and they will try to pull the ball towards them. Whoever will be able to pull the ball towards him, he will win the match, okay? But at the same time, it shows like how much concentrated he can be, okay? This can be done using this sort of basic uh, brain signal analysis. Okay, of course, this is for interactive games, okay, where like, uh, which are popular in uh, Europe, okay, so where they can actually afford that. We can think about our own applications in India, which are really critical, say, for example, health saving applications, okay, life saving applications, okay, wellness applications. A lot of interesting applications can be thought about in similar sense. But the interesting thing here is, so whatever the data which you are trying to collect the signals, if you try to push all these signals directly to the cloud, you will immediately lose the real-time application, okay? You will not be able to get the same sort of uh, virtual reality-based gameplay. Okay. Alternatively, what they were doing is, they have their pad, okay? The signals will be collected at the pad. If the pad can process, it is already processing. A little bit more processing will be done at the sort of servers which are lying in the corner, okay? And then, like, once this processing is done, certain values will be predicted based on the concentration and everything. And these are the values which will be going to the cloud, which will be basically synchronized among the friends who are playing across different countries. Okay. So these sort of fog applications we can actually think about. Okay. Very interesting applications. So 
for the rest, the remaining discussion of this task, of this talk. So basically, this is the fog architecture which I will rather assume. Okay. So at the core level are these sort of edge nodes, are edge devices. Okay. The things from where we are actually collecting the sensor information, we are putting them at these sort of different gateways. Okay. Raspberry Pi can be a gateway. Okay. Say for example, you are collecting the sensor information from an Arduino board. Okay. And then like which is being collected at this sort of Raspberry Pi, which actually acts as a gateway. It can do the processing. If it can't do the processing, it can actually push it to a local private cloud, which is around. Okay. Or like the network switches and rotors. Okay. Or eventually it can move some of the processing to the cloud. So basically, like if at all the processing is done, something from the core networks to the fog, I'm calling it as fog computing. People are also calling them as edge analytics. Okay. So all these sort of fog applications, whichever I have talked about, which actually require this sort of data analytics, can be put into this sort of edge analytics. Yesterday, we also have uh, discussed about federated learning. That is something like which is coming in recent times. Okay. So you can actually do this sort of machine learning based on the data, whichever is generated within this proximity. Okay. Of this sort of fog proximity. Okay. That's also very interesting. Okay. If you want to really push all the data and if you are doing this sort of large scale data processing using this sort of parallelizable mechanism, something like MapReduce, Link, Spark. Okay. So that is like uh, what you are, will be doing at the cloud layer. Okay, this is the basic power architecture. I'm assuming for the rest of the talk. If I think of the fog architecture like that, there are two different types of applications possible, fog computing applications possible. One of them is this sort of top-down applications. So these are the applications that are managed by the cloud provider. The cloud provider himself actually knows what is the application he wants to deploy, and he will actually set up the respective infrastructure. Okay, say for example, assume this is also a very popular application which came and uh, during the early years of fog computing. Okay, so basically, like uh, what it was in Spain. So the basic idea is like Spain has actually deployed these fog servers across their popular cities. Okay, Barcelona and those cities. Okay, so what these fog servers were offering to the Tourists is okay. Say, for example, any tourist who has actually come to a particular place which he has visited that site. Okay, these fog servers basically was collecting that information and also like his interest that means like whichever the other places which he has visited during that day or like during that visit. Okay, these things were actually processing that information, these fog servers, and they were actually suggesting him like what was the next spot he could actually be interested in. Okay, this sort of processing can be dynamically done. This will actually help a tourist. Say, for example, if you go to Europe, okay, to any cities, okay, so there will be a lot of places to you visit, okay, but you will not be visiting all the places, okay, you will have a day or two for travel, so you have to choose whichever places, and these sort of fog nodes were actually helping them. But in that case, it is the cloud provider who is actually managing where these sort of fog nodes are deployed. It is the Spain government which actually has deployed all these nodes, and then like from there, like the data is collected, it is being processed. And cloud providers actually manage based on the proximity, okay, based on the location, and based on the QoS parameters, such as like, say, for example, user load. If, if for a different application, like if one of the fog node is really loaded, the next request can be routed to the next fog node, okay, which can be a little bit further, but the processing can be done faster. Okay. So these are all top-down based applications. But a lot more popular ones, which we will be trying a lot, will be these sort of bottom-up applications bottom-up fog-based applications. The applications that are managed by individual service providers. So think about a scenario. Uh, say, for example, like, okay, this is a running example, which I will be using again, okay? So basically, like, think there is a disabled person, okay? He is on a wheelchair. He is going from point A to point B, okay? Point A to point B. Think about this situation. And basically, like, he wants to he is basically trying, he is going in the streets and he wants to avoid crowded places. How he will be doing that one? Okay. Basically, he, he, will base, he has a mobile phone, using which like he can actually connect to the sensors which are lying around. He will try to get that information from those sensors. And then like, uh, if at all there are any noise sensors, he will identify, okay. And based on the noise sensors, like he will get the noise level in that particular things, okay. So, and then if a noise level in a particular street is pretty high, he will actually avoid that street. 
assume like he's going in this line. If he sees like at this point, there is a lot of noise somewhere here, he will take a different route. Okay, that's an application. In this sort of application, if you want to run, this sort of processing, whatever has to be done, has to be done in the local servers. He has to find some fog servers which are lying in proximity. These fog resources are actually provided by different vendors, okay, which can be like general public or private nodes or like network operators or whatever it is. The processing can be done there, okay. And most often with these sort of bottom up applications, it is the gateway nodes. In if you remember my earlier picture, it is the gateway nodes which actually decide on which of the fog nodes it should be running. Say, for example, if some processing has to be done, it is a gateway which actually decides the processing should be done on this. This is for the bottom up applications. For the top down applications, it is the cloud which actually decides where the infrastructure is and where the a particular user's application should be running. It will actually decide. Okay, so that's the difference between these two types of for computing applications. Great. I have given certain examples. Okay. I have given the background, how the things have evolved over the time. I have given enough background so that like we can really look at certain research challenges which are critical in for computing and where the state of the art is and where these sort of new research is basically going on. Okay. Some of the very well-known research challenges in power computing are frameworks for establishing fog setup. I'm talking about fog computing. How do you establish a fog network? That's a critical challenge, isn't it? And then like fog resource provisioning. Say, for example, if I say like I am trying to take the advantage of uh, nearby resources, okay, nearby servers, okay, in the street. Say, for example, if there are coffee shops in that one, they have their servers. They basically can provide you the whatever the ideal time whenever they are free. Okay, they can be actually offloaded for some processing. Of course, like they can get some monetary gain for that one. Okay, or some other type of service which the city will basically want to provide them. Okay. We can think about a lot of interesting applications, but the problem is how do we be able to decide what how to provide these resources? How resource provisioning is critical? Who will provide the resources which are required for that particular processing? How do we be able to dynamically discuss the fog nodes and also like the fog services on these fog nodes? And assume like uh, the other challenges are like say for example, assume like you have the perfect fog setup. Do we have any fog execution frameworks? Okay, that's also a critical challenge. And then like uh, on which of the fog node like you will be placing the applications? That's also a major research challenge. Okay, several of you are actually asking about like where the future research should be going. So this is where like I will try to address all those things. And mobility of the fog devices is also critical. I will talk about that. Okay, so let's try to address all these challenges one after the other. The first challenge which we will be looking at is how to be able to establish such a fog network. The earlier example which I have given you, okay, so the disabled person is going from point A to point B. Now that the situation has come, I will try to give you a little bit more information. Earlier I said, like, say, for example, whenever he is actually walking in this point A to point B, okay, he is trying to go in that street and trying to connect to these different sensors which are in proximity, okay, which the phone can actually connect to. Then basically, once you try to connect to each sensor, you will try to get the meta information from that one, which will be like, uh, say, for example, a WSDL description, which it provides, or like, say, for example, a JSON, okay, which it provides, what is the service it is basically provided, okay? Now, the point is, so basically, like, what you can do is, like, you can get that meta information, and you can process that, and you can basically try to find, like, what are the noise sensors, okay, which actually can measure these sort of noise levels. So for that one, like say what this phone has to do is like it has to get the meta information of say for example in the street there are 50 different sensors. It has to get the meta information of all these 50 different sensors and has to check each, verify each and every one if there is any noise sensor. Probably there will be only two or three noise sensors in that particular street. Okay, 50 sensors, 50 meta information, the phone can process. These phones are really capable, they can process. But if in a different street, if there are thousand sensors, what you do? Definitely, you have to offload that to a much powerful fog node. So we have actually proposed a concept called Indie Fog, a system architecture for enabling fog computing using this, using this sort of customer premising. Right? The way like I was giving the example, in any street like there are certain coffee shops. These coffee shops have these sort of servers. Whenever they are ideal, they can actually show, share their processing capabilities, provided such a fog framework is established. So we were actually proposing for this sort of indie form. Okay, traditional models basically fall into something like a grid computing model. Okay, 
once you have such a framework ready, say for example, while you are here, you can actually push some of your tasks here, okay? And it will be doing the processing. And while if there are no fog nodes in proximity, say for example, in T2, you will store those tasks or uh, parallelly you are processing some of the tasks yourself. And whenever you try to come to a next zone where you have access to the more fog nodes, you will be offloading all these tasks to these sort of fog nodes. And the fog nodes among themselves can actually collaborate in processing all these individual tasks. Excuse me. This proactive fog computing can actually happen as work stealing as well. Okay. Of course, the critical challenges will be how to be able to find the ideal fog node for the processing. How do we be able to respectively find that particular service on that particular fog node? Okay. So these all will be the critical challenges which the community still has to address. Okay. That's about this indie fog is concerned. Great. <clears throat> Assume we had a perfect setup. There, like you can actually find a perfect fog environment, fog framework, which is established. And assume like you have access to, say, for example, 10 fog nodes. Assume like you have access to 10 uh, Raspberry Pis, which are actually as gateways, okay? So are like fog nodes. And uh, you have a service request, okay? So there is an IoT sensor, okay, which is actually collecting some information. For an IoT application, it has to do the processing. You came to the gateway, you got that data. Now you want to basically do the processing on these sort of 10 different uh, Raspberry Pis, which you have moved, which is in close proximity. Do we have an execution framework so that like you can actually, assume like this task is not a simple task, which has to be actually parallelized. Say for example, the RMA model, which I said earlier about this sort of uh, uh, sensor data prediction values, next thing, okay? So it can be parallelized. So the more machines you have, the quicker you will basically get these results, okay? Do we have an execution framework for that? Yes, we do have, okay? So active programming model is a very good thing for that one. This is actually coming from this sort of distributed and fault tolerance execution framework, okay? So which can be used for, uh, for fault computing applications as well. This is based on active programming model. It was originally conceived as a universal paradigm for con concurrent computation, okay? People are slowly tending, forgetting the basics actually, okay? So the active programming is a, an excellent model for that one. The basic unit of computation in active programming model is, there will be individual actors who can actually do the processing of a particular task. These actors, the only thing they know is they can do certain processing. If they want to talk with any other actor, the only means they will do is they will communicate a message to another actor. And that actor actually knows when it receives a message, what is the processing it has to do. And actor programming model is excellent for that one. Okay, and of course, like the actors can create the child actors creating like parent-child relations and if the parent is killed down, the children will be killed. Okay, so conceptually, it is a very good one, okay. Then with respect to actor programming model, okay, so there are implementations, something like an ACA framework. ACA framework is an actor programming model implementation. These frameworks are light enough, you can actually be able to run them on Raspberry Pi as well. We actually had this sort of setup where like we had these Docker containers on which we were actually running the ACA framework, which was actually deployed on this sort of uh, fog framework, fog network, which I had, say for example, on this sort of 10 different Raspberry Pis, and you can actually send any distributed and parallel tasks onto this sort of fog framework, okay? So ACA framework is something which can be looked by people, okay? So we have all the source code, everything GitHub, on GitHub, you can look at this one, okay? We got it published in Future Generation Computer Science recently. So this is one uh, thing. And another very interesting framework which uh, Professor Rajiv Wankar has discussed during the last session is this sort of serverless computing. Serverless computing is a really good one, okay? See, one of the very interesting things is IoT workloads, most of them which we see is are based on event-driven programming. So a certain sensor value we are reading, okay? Say for example, a temperature value we are regularly reading. Okay, and then like there is a sudden change in temperature. Okay, say for example, all of a sudden like uh, there is huge change in temperature, okay, with that one. And with that one, we are trying to predict whether it is a fire which has actually caused that one. Okay, whether it can be a forest fire or like it can be a fire in the building or whatever it is. Okay, that's a perfect event-based mechanism, event-driven programming. So you received a sensor, 
there is an abnormal value in that one based on that one like you want to do certain processing and serverless computing is excellent for that one. okay and these are event action platforms to basically execute the code in response to events professor rajiv walker has talked about different frameworks okay say for example like uh, aws lambda okay uh, and then like uh, he also talked about uh, the IBM services, OpenMix, okay, and those things. These are a little bit heavy, okay, but there are also certain frameworks which are light enough, you can actually run them on Raspberry Pis. It is actually possible. There is a framework called OpenFast, which is light enough that you can actually do, uh, you can actually execute it on a Raspberry Pi, which we have actually checked it, okay, which we have actually published the results at IT Police Census, okay, and Nagendra and myself and along with our colleagues. So serverless is an ideal solution for fog computing, okay? So I will assume this and then like I will also use it in, in my other discussions, okay? So you can have a serverless uh, execution framework on a Raspberry Pi and you can actually use it in your fog process, okay? That's also one domain which can be looked at. Good, then comes a little bit uh, more of challenges. Great, like what I have given you as of now is like how we establish a power framework. I have given you one solution. For executing applications on this sort of distributed fog, like I have given you ACA as the solution, ACA program model as solution, and serverless uh, being uh, deployed on this sort of flow nodes, also as a solution which actually can help you with this sort of event data processing. Okay. But then, like, say for example, if you have a lot of fog nodes lying around, okay, and say for example, like on which of the fog nodes you will be running the thing. Say, for example, resource to IoT applications are to be run on this fog topology, and you should be dynamically be able to find on which of the fog node you should be running. If I have three fog nodes available in proximity, say, for example, most of this decision logic is taking there, take place in my gateway node. So I have access to three fog nodes on which of them I will be running. Always my quality of service will be deciding where I will be executing that one based on this quality of service parameters, something like latency how much latency it will be caused if I basically run the processing on this one, or like how much resource utilization, whether that particular fog node is already loaded with other requests, okay? All these things will critically uh, affect my decision. There are different models for studying this one. People have been looking extensively on this, and then like during the last two years, like we had also significant contributions on them, okay? All these problems can be shaped as multi-objective optimization problems, okay? Because like I want to reduce the latency, I want to efficiently utilize the resources, I want to reduce the cost, okay? So I have multiple objectives, okay? So these problems can be shaped as multi-objective offloading strategies. But the problem is you have to run these things on the gateway node, which actually has to decide where you have to execute them. Okay, these are following my bottom-up applications, bottom-up fog applications. So that's a big problem because like multi-objective optimization problems, they are anti-hard. So you need to have perfect heuristics and meta heuristic solutions for that, okay? And of course, like we also have to consider the graph topology for all these things. So these are the things like which I will be discussing in the coming 10 to 15 minutes, okay? And I will give you hints where the research can basically proceed. Yesterday, some of the people were asking like, I'm a mathematician, where I will be looking at? Where, where what are the domains where I will be looking at future research in terms of IoT domain is concerned? The next few slides will be perfectly targeting at you, okay? You can provide perfect solutions, propose perfect solutions for that. Let's look at that. Let us look at some of them, okay? So I will not be going very deep into them, or else like I will bore you. Say for example, like each of the solution I can explain for an hour, okay? So we don't have that much time. I will give you the references to those papers as well. You can actually check them, okay? So here is a publication which we had at Internet of Things Journal, okay? I typically Internet of Things Journal in 2020. So the basic idea is like, we are trying to offload this one. And here we have assumed like we have different layers of fog images. These are like, say for example, originally at the sensors level, and then like these are our gateways where the decision process is happening. And here are these sort of low capacity fog servers where like resource constraint images, you can do certain processing there, okay? Um, mainly process like very delay sensitive applications. Say for example, any quick response you want, you will be processing it there. If not at higher capacity fog nodes, okay? So a little bit more processing, okay? process larger intensive tasks. If not, like you will be pushed to the cloud where you can, you have unlimited uh, uh, resources available for you. Of course, as long as you can pay for them. That is uh, the catch with this sort of cloud computing is the cloud layer. 
Now we assume like we have these sort of different layers. Then you can actually formulate a problem something like this. If you have a task which is to be offloaded, the task will have say for example different cost sources. You can have this sort of computation cost. How much CPU it will be consuming? How much memory you will be consuming? This you can mathematically have a formula for that one. And then like say for example you can have a communication latency as well. A fog load line which is in this room and a fog load line we say for example in a different room in the same building. So the cost of pushing communication, cost of pushing a task to this fog node, which is within this room, is much lesser than pushing something to a, a Raspberry Pi, which is lying in a different building. Okay, so there will be some sort of communication cost also will be associated. These two things will be the total cost associated for that one, and you can have the other optimization strategies as well. Say, for example, like now you, I want to efficiently utilize the resources. Say, for example, all my fog nodes should be loaded 80% as capacity. That would be one of my QA's requirement. So that also like I can formulate the things and basically I can formulate a multi-object optimization problem out of it. Of course, you can shape this problem differently. A mathematician can come, he can shape this problem differently and he can actually apply it to his own application. Now, great. That's a multi-object optimization problem. So solving them is really problematic. And this is where like uh, the soft computing fundamentally helps us. Say, for example, in this paper, we tried to solve that problem using meta heuristics, using accelerated particle swarm optimization. Okay, particle swarm optimization, probably several of you know about this one. Say, for example, to solve an optimization problem, like in fish of schools or like birds trying to find some sort of food, they all will be moving together. Okay, so each, each of these birds will be moving. Its next destination will be decided on, the, on where this sort of optimal solution is. Okay, say, for example, it's uh, Velocity and then like its direction in vector space will actually depend on this. One, okay. Okay. Let's not go deeper into these topics. Okay. But the particle swarm optimization, the best solution where your velocity should be, where your position for the next interval should be, depends on the global best, also your individual best. Okay. So that is the particle swarm optimization. Accelerated particle swarm optimization ignores this sort of individual best. It only focuses at the global best. Okay. And we have used that one for basically deciding like on which of these sort of fog node we can actually offload these tasks. This is full of mathematics, okay? This is mathematics which is applied for solving a particular application domain problem, okay? A mathematician, another one can come and propose a perfect solution for that one or probably can provide improvements to these works, okay? Not just the quality of service, quality of experience is also very interesting. Okay, so these are a lot of things like which we should be looking at. A lot of research challenges are coming. Okay? People are really trying to address these things. Quality of service refers to this sort of overall features, how the system, whether it will support whatever the things it has to be, it has to support. Okay, say for example, a QoS uh, example can be like, uh, there is an agreement stating like, if you want to download a file, if you want to download the file, can the, and the, uh, the file has to be downloaded within five minutes. That is the QS requirement. So that means like if you can't download the file within Q, within these five minutes, you are failing your uh, quality of service requirements, there will be a penalty for that, okay? So the quality of service, you can have these sort of agreements, okay? So a lot of resets happen also on that direction. Then clearly you can define it based on that one, like you can also define the cost models for that. Okay, a lot of research has gone into that. But then like there is a difference between quality of service and quality of experience. What the quality of service is saying is like, I should, the file should be able to be downloaded within five minutes. But then there can be two different users. One of the user is okay, even if the file is downloaded in seven minutes. Okay, so in that case, like you are failing your quality of service requirement, there will be a penalty for you, but still the user basically uses it. But there will be another guy for whom his quality of experience requirements are a little bit higher. He wants that file to be downloaded within three minutes. If you can't download within three minutes, even though you have satisfied the quality of service, this guy is not happy. Quality of experience is critical. That actually depends on the users. And each end user's perceived quality of experience is his own. And then like these things can eventually degrade the acceptability of an application. So what we are trying to do, after all, like we are trying to deploy these sort of IoT applications on these sort of fog devices for the satisfaction of the user. If he is not satisfied, then we have not we have failed something. But how to decide on this? Again, using this sort of uh, this is uh, another publication in Journal of Parallel and Distributed Computing. Okay, so 
So using fuzzy logic, you can actually decide this one. Okay. Once again, what I'm trying to say is like, I'm trying to give you a quick summary of the things, what the research is happening there. If you are really interested, you can basically check those things, check those publications, okay, which I will give you as the references. And if you are really interested, you can later approach me. You can actually mail me anytime, okay? No problem. So based on the fudgy logic, you can actually decide, okay? So you can actually use the fudgy logic that actually prioritizes different application placement requests, okay? Say, for example, different users are asking this gateway node, okay, deploy my application onto one of these form nodes. And based on this sort of fudgy logic, we can actually come with this sort of rating of expectation of each and every user based on his uh, quality of experience, experience. Okay. Similarly, like for each and every fog node which you have, we can also calculate another thing called capacity class four, again using fudgy logic, which actually decides like how much loaded that particular node is. And once you have these two things, you can actually match them using again optimization problem. Okay. And then you can actually say like for which of the user where this sort of cost should be running. Okay, that's a very interesting problem. So the assumption here is, okay, say for example, any application will have a client module and also an application module, which is actually running in the containers on this sort of fog nodes. Thanks to Professor Rajiv Hunkar again. So he has excellently described what is the containers, dockers and everything there, isn't it? So, I have this sort of Docker setup on my fog nodes. That means like they are running there. So my client units are running on these sort of gateway nodes where like I need to basically start executing the tasks on the fog nodes. And the fog nodes, we have these things running on these sort of uh, Docker containers. Great. Now, how do I do it? Okay. I'll not go into all the details, but then like simply to calculate this sort of rating of expectation of each and every user, I can basically have different parameters from the user. Say, for example, access rate. He wants whether a slow access rate or like normal or fast. Say, for example, if it is a health related application, you need the fast response. Okay, so there it will be high. Okay, and the required resources, say, for example, if it is a simple processing, a small fog node is sufficient. Okay, and if he, he needs a lot of resources, either a distributed processing he needs or like he has to go to the cloud. Okay, that's also can be shaped like that one and processing time, how quickly the response should be coming. Okay. All these are critical parameters, okay? You can actually define these sort of fudgy rules out of this sort of, for this calculating this ROA uh, expectation, okay? Using this fudgy setup. Of course, using the uh, center of gravity, you can actually defudgify the number, okay? So that which you can use in processing. Similarly, rating of expectation for the user for whatever the applications which are to be offered. And you can also calculate this sort of capacity class score for this sort of nodes, okay? So different form nodes. For them, like uh, round trip time is critical, how far the fog node is, okay? Uh, resource availability is critical. If it is already very loaded, there is no point in offloading another task and then making it busy. Processing speed also like matters. Okay. So you can basically calculate this capacity score using that. Once you have that one, you can actually shape them as an optimization problem, okay? And again, you can get a perfect solution where this gateway node can decide where that particular application can be run on a fog node. It can be for different applications which are coming in parallel to the fog node, and it is trying to decide each application where it is running, dynamical. <clears throat> lot of interesting problems, okay? So a lot of research is being done. Of course, a similar extension for that one, I will not go deeper into this one. There can be different priority for applications, okay? So for example, like there are different uh, applications, uh, task priority one where like, uh, uh, they are delay sensitive applications with hard deadlines, say for example, health related applications, no negotiation with the deadline. So if uh, the negotiation has failed, if they have failed to deliver the quality of service, something seriously wrong happened to the patient, okay? So these are priority one task which should be run immediately on the fog devices. Okay? And then like a little bit uh, higher priority tasks, task priority two, these will be like uh, with softer deadlines. So you should be able to run them within the soft deadlines. If you don't meet the deadline also, like it is okay. But then there can be task priority three, which are like long running tasks, resource intensive tasks, which you will push them to the cloud. And probably that processing will take weeks also sometimes. Okay. But if you want to have this sort of different sort of types of setups and different sorts of processing on the fog nodes, okay. So you can have this sort of uh, different queuing mechanisms using which you can actually, the ultimate goal will be to minimize this sort of overall queuing waiting time you have different priority queues. 
okay so it is called multi level uh, feedback queuing okay so the task will be actually moving between the queues so that like they will be eventually executed the ultimate goal is to basically reduce the overall queuing waiting time for all the tasks <coughs> okay so this is again like published in internet of things journal okay so people can actually look at that one if you are really curious good until now all the tasks which i have talked about okay computationally what i have told them is like there is some task here which has to be offloaded to some other place you will execute it there you will get the results back and you will continue with your execution these are simple offloading tasks but the task itself can be a complex one okay you can actually design both these okay user application and also like the infrastructure whatever you have you can design them using graph theory say for example like in graph theory and then like process executions and then like say for example workflow executions there are a lot of works which were done which actually deal with these things okay the tasks are to be actually mapped as a workflow there like say for example d2 can only be executed after b1 and if you have such tasks okay and if such workflows are to be executed on these box setups how to deal with this task this is a problem not only interesting for mathematicians it's also interesting for core computer scientists okay graph theory based applications and solutions and which if you have the perfect solution for that one which can be actually deployed in this sort of iot based applications which are real time applications which are being studied today okay so there is you should be able to find the link between the theory the basics the background and to the futuristic applications whatever you are thinking about good there is also scope for software engineering guys okay pure computer science so the software engineering guys say for example the earlier application which i have talked about say for example this disabled person going from point a to point b and then like he is trying to get this sort of different sensor information and the each sensor information he is getting the meta information and processing it and trying to find whether it is a noise sensor if so he is basically trying to collect the values that can be actually designed as a business process okay the software engineering people who are in this audience list actually will be knowing about these things so you can actually design that complete process in that process say for example like the going to each and every sensor connecting to it getting the meta information and processing that meta information of that particular sensor and knowing whether that is the noise sensor if it is noise sensor like getting the noise value can be designed as a sub process sub software process which can be offloaded to the fog node while the process is actually executing okay this is a major research again like which we have been looking uh, for the past uh, four or five years okay so we have also some contributions here we even have developed simulators for this one okay for the people who are interested i'll discuss about this one okay the the tool is called step one simulate a test bed for edge processing based on this sort of op opportunity test network emulator not just processes you can offload it also takes care of mobility issues mobility is a very critical thing in the fog domain so see here what we are doing is like you always don't have to assume like these sort of sensors are just lying in a corner the objects are lying in a corner say for example in a transportation application a moving car can be the thing so that means like the moving car is actually going in a street at a certain speed okay and then like uh, it will have access to a particular fog node for processing for offloading the processing only for certain amount of time okay so mobility is very critical okay so for example like i will give you a scenario say for example if this guy is basically has access to this fog node and he is trying to start offloading and before he finished the task he went out in case one so then it is a waste of offloading so the fog node is overloaded okay you didn't get the result here okay the case one the case two is like you are really at the edge of the network and then like you are trying to send the data okay push the thing to the fog node and before you actually finish so it has taken a lot of time the ideal scenario would be case four where like say for example you are really close to the fog node then you offload it okay then you will have the results very quickly you will continue with the execution and then like you move on but the point is you should not be thinking only from your side the fog node can also be busy isn't it it may be busy because like several other uh, people are also trying to use that fog node okay how do you deal with these things and here in this scenario i have fixed the fog node the fog node itself is fixed and then like the car is moving but you can also think about today drones are very common okay so the drone itself is moving and say for example you have the different deployed sensors there 
assume like you can think about a smart agriculture based application you are actually the drone is actually moving in the farm fields and then like it is basically trying to collect the information and it is already processing it say for example based on the pictures images and then like uh, based on certain values if it has detected like say for example a certain part of the field is bug infested it can immediately sprinkle some sort of fish cells it can dynamically decide that that sort of federated intelligence eventually will be seen on these fog nodes but in this case like the fog node itself is moving for modeling those things how do you test such applications how do you basically deploy such applications will you be deploying that in sense like in the real setup like you will be trying those things it will not be ideal you need certain sort of simulators for that one we have actually developed this step one simulator for that one it can actually help you with this one so everything we have done as of now everything is open source we have the github source code i have kept the links are the papers will have the respective links to the source code okay you can actually use them okay say for example for using this step one simulator there are also tutorials we have kept them on okay everything you can find them at this thing using this one like we have actually demonstrated scenarios okay so of course like simulator and then like demonstrated the scenarios this is top to map okay so of course like uh, okay so the top to city in estonia that's where like uh, i was there during the last 10 years so there are buses okay which will be actually moving around okay say so there is there is this route okay say so i think this is bus number 6 and like this is something else okay so once these buses are moving in the streets there are fog nodes deployed physically actually these fog nodes are deployed in all these bus stations say for example what you can do is we can say for example i said like there is a lot of snow around okay whenever like there is a lot of snow falls on a particular street uh the city government has to remove the snow either they will be plowing the snow they will be throwing the out or like they will be uh, throwing salt so that like the snow melts very quickly okay so these are the things like which have to be taken care so the buses will have these sort of videos using which like they may actually collect the information say for example from point a to point b the bus will be collecting that video and it will be basically pushing to that fog node for processing okay so if the fog node basically processes that video and then finds like that part of the street is not good okay and then like it will inform the sort of city upper through the cloud layers and all these things can be basically designed as business process and then like they can be simulated giving uh, these mobility aspects are also considered okay so you can actually check the tutorials we have those videos there so great i have discussed about what is fog computing and i have given like so what is different research which is happening okay a lot of people are trying to address different challenges okay the state of the art i have already given so a lot of advances have happened still there is huge scope for that and i will try to give you further scope okay which you immediately can jump from tomorrow and then like try to solve those problems okay standard based dynamic deployment is a huge problem in fog applications okay i will tell you something like this until now whatever the applications which i have i have talked either the cloud node or the fog node or the fog providers have actually deployed the fog infrastructure and have actually deployed those fog services as well there okay and then like they are using in different applications most often these fog nodes will be idle can they be used for some other applications or dynamically you can deploy another service on those fog nodes and until you actually lead them to the cloud and do the processing dynamically is it possible can you achieve interoperability in that way can you achieve heterogeneity in that way cloud computing domain actually try to solve that one with standard something like oas is tosca topology and orchestration specification for cloud applications using which like this is based on infrastructure as code okay you can actually check what is this one so it is again a huge field okay based on this devops mechanism you actually define your specification using this sort of infrastructure as code using say for example yaml yet another markup language okay so r based on xml or whatever it is you define your configuration you give them to exec uh, some uh, executors so basically they are called like orchestrators you give this sort of tosca specification based uh, specification of a particular application to an orchestrator and then you basically tell like deploy it in amija it dynamically deploys in amija on aws services tomorrow if you are not happy with aws services put it down and then like deploy it in google you just give this sort of uh, dynamic deployment configuration okay and uh, the orchestrator if it is capable it can actually run on uh, say for example uh, uh, on google cloud or on say for example microsoft azure 
okay different rp status if you are really interested in cloudify is one thing okay uh, and then like lot of european commission projects are actually dealing with these things dynamic uh, modeling we have also run several projects there okay so based on this sort of dynamic deployment can we have similar sort of deployment for these sort of fog nodes that would be a very interesting thing okay so that's also a research challenge which we can look at okay and of course like i already have discussed about a lot of uh, resource provisioning strategies qa aware qa e aware application scheduling strategies okay and self adaptive strategies can you be able to look at them okay so that is also another research challenge okay and then like say for example all this data whatever you have to move to so basically to the cloud for processing are these sort of fog nodes can we have some sort of data pipelines say for example whatever the data which is moving across these fog nodes can you be able to streamline the processing okay using data pipelines technology say for example people who are aware of apache nifi that's a very interesting thing to look at okay and then like all this sort of nifi while the data is actually moving all the intermediate processing whatever is happening it can happen on a serverless framework okay and that's what we have discussed as well open fast based execution of the data on each of the fog node at the fog node that fog data the data is moving across the fog nodes using these sort of data pipelines can you achieve that these are all interesting problems which we can really look into okay so interesting challenges so of course like uh, eventually we have to drag all this research and we should be able to deploy these things in different applications smart city applications smart healthcare applications smart agriculture okay eventually whatever the research models we propose okay they are very good for journals but eventually if you are basically want to show them you need to have the applications okay so you can think about all these things thank you very much for your attention okay so based on all the research which we have done we have executed several european commission projects okay and also of course i have edited a book on fog and edge computing along with professor rajkumar guyai people who might have heard about in cloud computing okay so basically like we do have edited this book we also have actually written a manifesto for cloud computing what is the latest research which should be happening in the cloud computing domain people who are interested actually can check about cloud computing manifesto which was co-led by me and uh, professor rajkumar guyai okay so it is basically authored by almost 25 excellent authors from across the globe so people who are interested you can actually check those things thank you very much for your attention here are a little bit uh, a bunch of references which you can check at them okay thank you if you have any questions i'm open thank you sir thank you very much for uh, uh, dwelling upon the importance of fog computing and uh, so how, uh, i think the participants now at least uh, try to assimilate how the raspberry pi can be used and how it can be used as a fog node and what are all the things can be done <clears throat> with the fog computing so in terms of what all the things can be done with the raspberry pi so it is uh, neatly given the instructions yes uh, yeah the participants are saying is very nice session and uh, everyone is uh, i think happy with this so uh, it, sir it, sorry uh, to interrupt you sir Mm -hmm. uh, sir, there is a question in the chat box. Sir, uh, may I read out the question, sir? Yeah, please. So, can we use fog nodes uh, in drones? Uh, so yes, like exactly. The question is not. Uh, so, the other question is, uh, which cloud is suitable for research? So many clouds are available. <laughs> okay, so that's a, a very good uh, question. So, basically, like most of these clouds will give you some basic amounts. For doing initial research, say for example, you go to Amazon Cloud Services, AWS is good for uh, one thing. Every new feature, every new research which has come into this cloud computing domain, AWS will immediately try it. AWS will also give you say basic amount so that like you can actually try and test those features. So you can actually start with that one. That's a very good cloud, no problem. A similar thing is with this Google Cloud as well, and also with this sort of. Uh, Microsoft Azure as well. If you are a student, you will basically get some credit using which you can actually run the things. But they always require a credit card for you because, like, if you basically cross the limits, you will be charged. There are perfect private cloud technologies. Say, for example, OpenStack. OpenStack is a very good one. Okay, uh, which is a private cloud platform which you can actually establish in your own cloud in your own infrastructure in your university or whatever it is. and on that one like you can actually try out all these sort of basic infrastructure as services platform as services software as services okay the serverless computing everything you can try there okay so i have given you two solutions 
one thing either go with the commercial ones you will learn the latest things or have your own private cloud setup okay using one of these things originally we have started with eucalyptus way back in 2009 so now open stack is really good so you can basically go with that one. so yeah. next next question sir uh, how to use for computing with image processing image processing the example which i have given is perfectly based on image processing isn't it say for example like uh, we have taken thought about the scenario which we have discussed yesterday okay so the scenario where we have to identify an intruder okay based on the image processing okay. and then like you are actually trying to process how many uh, uh, trying to decide like how many frames you will be actually sending out okay say for example frames per second you will be sending out so that like the processing can happen as far as the stream is concerned if you are looking at the specific solutions of course like as part of this uh, fdp you will be having certain demo and again there will be basically showing you like how you can actually process the videos okay using this open cv on these raspberry pis and everything you will be seeing those things in the demonstrations okay that is guaranteed but uh, the example which i have discussed is perfectly based on image processing so next question sir how to characterize workload uh, in edge computing How to, how to characterize workload workload in edge computing okay perfect okay i have given you one solution already so basically like uh, i have said like you can actually prioritize these tasks okay the workload whatever is coming you can actually have different sorts of priority for that one and you can actually characterize like how you will be processing them where you will be processing them you can actually def- design them as queuing models okay so the queuing models have actually studied like how different the queues can be actually modeled workload even for traditional servers we could actually perfectly model them we can do the same thing on the fork computing as well people can actually extend these works next question sir which is the latest area for research in cloud computing can you suggest sir okay i actually have told you one thing okay so the, i think i don't have the slide okay but then like recently in 20, 2019 we have actually published cloud computing manifesto okay if people are really interested you just search for this cloud computing manifesto okay which is basically published by 25 experts from different fields in cloud computing we came together okay it is a huge process which actually myself and professor rajkumar buya has led it actually took us one year to actually publish that work okay there is a lot of effort there there are a lot of research challenges which were discussed we have discussed what is the state of the art how far we have actually come to and then like what are the latest advances which are really coming and then like how it will actually affect okay so which is published in acm computing service you can actually check that one uh, if people are curious i can actually share that okay let me see if i had it in the references no it is not here in this references but then like uh, you can actually search okay so you can basically go to google scholar and then there's just search for cloud manifesto okay so this is the manifesto so a manifesto for future generation cloud computing research directions for the next decade and this is where like uh, anybody who is trying to start his research should be able to find one very interesting domain if it can't offer you a interesting research domain we have actually failed in our research let me put it on state so next question sir for computing will increase throughput or not it will definitely increase throughput okay uh, but the point is like that is where these sort of qa challenges you have to address okay so for example like here i basically said this one in this sort of quality of experience you will still have some sort of throughput okay say for example how far this sort of fog load is existing will have some sort of effect round trip time depends on the how far the fog load is so if the fog load is say for example in the next building i have throughput at least up to the next building however if the fog load is like just here what is the throughput i have if both of them are in the same network there i am really reducing the throughput but if i am trying to offload to a private cloud or like an infrastructure which is lying somewhere closer okay so then you are actually increasing the throughput within that network so you can assume like that one 
but you can perfectly design a quality of service model for that one, mathematical model for that one, and you can actually see that it is reduced. So next question, sir, what is the best research topic with IoT? <laughs> Come on, I have given you uh, 15, 20 different papers, publications, and then like latest research, okay? To me, it is almost asking like a father, what is your best research? Who is your best child? I can't pinpoint, sorry. All these things are really critical challenges, okay? And then like, even though people have addressed certain things, still there is huge scope for them. Scope for doing new research in every domain which I have found. Uh, another uh, request from one of the participants, uh, references for workload characterization in edge computing. The same question was asked by, uh, uh, the uh, same participant asked another question also related to workload characterization. Mm -hmm. the, same part, the same participant is asking for uh, uh, references for workload characterization in edge computing. Workload characterization in workload edge computing. Workload characterization in edge computing. Some okay. references. So basically like what I would say is like you start here. Okay. And then like you basically see like the state of the art which we have mentioned. Definitely, you should be able to see like a workflow execution strategies, okay, which people have tried on this sort of edge computing or fog computing. That is one reference which you can start looking at. Alternatively, like you can also see from the sort of business processes which I have talked about, we have a recent publication called Step One for this sort of simulating the workflows. If you want to design these sort of workloads as workflows, you can actually start from here. I'm not just saying like we have the exact solution for that one, but then like you can actually look at the state of the art, which we have mentioned, and you can take that as the starting point for doing your extra, extra research. And then like probably you can actually simulate the things on the simulator, which we are making it open for you guys. So last question, sir. Software yeah, tools and uh, techniques for fog and edge computing by Buya for IoT. Okay. So I repeat. So, uh, that's a, and again, an interesting question. I already talked about uh, the fog bus, okay, which uh, he has recently released, okay, so which is based on this sort of, uh, the original thing is like, it's all based on the cloud sim, okay, then the grid sim has, grid sim has come to fog sim, cloud sim, then there's come like the fog sim, I fog sim, actually. I was the editor for that paper, okay. So I fog sim is there. And then like recently they have produced like uh, fog bus, okay, which they have produced. That student is, uh, his name is Suresh Tuli. You can actually check his research. Currently he is at uh, Imperial College London, okay, which is one of the top uh, universities, which is ranked like 10. We used to have the collaboration. Currently like uh, we have, of course at the University of Tartu, we had the collaboration and then like we have our own framework, which actually extended this sort of fog bus for that one. Because like fog bus is a simulator. You can also have this sort of execution framework as well, funding, which we called it as possible. Currently, it is uh, in under review at uh, uh, TPDS, so transactions in parallel and distributed systems. Okay, so it is under review. You can actually approach the first other, so of the form bus, and he may be able to give you the source code if you are curious. Okay. Once again, which I am trying to point, most of the European research, whatever we were doing, everything was free and then public. Okay. So most of the source code is already available. So you have to basically go search in the GitHub's and basically get access to these sort of resources and use them. That is one of the easiest way to start with research. Okay. So thank you, sir, uh, for Anything clarifying else? the doubts or questions. So that's all, sir. Uh, that's all. The, uh, those are the questions from the chat box, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So may I now request thank the participants. Uh, Yes, Srinivasa, please go ahead yes, with the sir. poll. Yes, sir. Uh, I request the participants to give their feedback for this session. Uh, and the next session is going to be at uh, 2.30. I will share the link shortly in WhatsApp group as well as through Google group. Thank you. Just give Thank your you, feedback. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.